wonderful name of Jesus this morning. Welcome to the service. And for those of you that are visiting us for the first time, a warm welcome to you and friends and family um, that are here to witness the baptism this morning. Um, a warm welcome to you. And this morning, it's a celebration. So even as the folk go through the waters of baptism, um, I expect you to scream louder than you scream for the spring box. Um, and we pray for the proteas. But, uh, but this morning, it is an honor and privilege to, um, to be baptizing these folk, even to hear their story and, their, and what God has done in their lives. And, um, and again, an honor and a privilege to be baptizing young people. Um, um, and, and declaring, as Paul declared, that I am not ashamed of the gospel. And, um, and it's, uh, like I said, an honor and a privilege to do that this morning. So even as we go through the waters um, of baptism, like I said, um, celebrate with them. Because this is a, a step in the right direction of professing their faith and what Christ has done in their hearts. Amen? Cool. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I've been a member of the church for, not a member, but um, coming to the church for quite some time, on and off, on and off, and for the past month, I've been here ritually every Sunday and getting very involved with the community service with Adal and Ada, um, which is an absolute blessing, and I, I can feel it's my calling, and um, I just felt that um, God is talking so, you know, wonderfully to me on a daily basis, and um, He's lifted me out of the pit, which I was very, very down. I was, I was low, and I, I believe you can only go that far down. From that side, from there, being so down, you can only go up. And he's lifted me so high up. I cannot explain to you the thrill I have with just serving God and serving the community and giving back to what God has given me and just realizing that all earthly things don't belong to you. It belongs to God. And you must do everything through him. And he will richly bless you as you go forth in your life. And that is where I want to be. Thank you. to me about it, we finally got to the point of assurance of salvation and what the Lord has done in our life, and taking this next step of publicly showing people what Christ has done in our hearts. Bye. 
by his blood for what he is. By the confession of your faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son. Christ has died for you? Do you believe that he died and he rose again on the third day? Do you believe that he's washed your sins away by his blood? By the confession of your faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I know I'm definitely going to cry at this one, so you're going to have to be super patient with me. Um, yeah, I just, I'm so privileged to have baptized, well, a few kids in the last couple months. Um, but nothing was more special than Justin coming and just saying, no, I think it's time to get rebaptized." And so, yeah, Justin's story that this is uh, the second time, but the most amazing experience happened. And for me to witness... Um, the change that has happened in his life is amazing. Um, if you guys have ever read that scripture of a new creation, that's exactly what happened with Justin. Um, I didn't know him previously. Like I just kind of, he was that guy who would just sit in church and leave and not really be interested in hanging out. And now I can say he's one of my closest friends, which is so awesome. Um, and it's been a privilege to lead him and see how much he's grown in his relationship with Christ. It's been amazing to see how devoted he is to God, how he finishes three books in like a space of two months, um, just in order for him to just know more about God and deepen his relationship. And it's just been amazing. And so, yeah, just the, the testimony of how the gospel transforms people's hearts is relevant to Justin's life. And so if you've never believed it before, Come talk to Justin. He can tell you all about it. Thank you, Leanne. Good morning, church. I'm going to be looking at my page because if I look up, I'm going to cry. When I think back to my walk with Christ, it has been quite a rocky and joyful journey. I think back about four or five months ago, I wasn't living pleasing to the Lord. I was doing my own thing, trusting my own understanding, trying to live life, my own rules. This constantly led to disappointment and heartbreak. I didn't trust the Lord in any of my decisions. I attended church because I had to, not because I wanted to. I was pretty stubborn even in being asked to attend young adults and events. I refused and thought it was just a waste of time. I was bitter towards the church because of my past experiences. In a church not... In, in a church, not this one. I was 
I was just waiting to get stabbed in the back again. But in April or June this year, I, asked, I was asked to help organize the soccer clinic because I love soccer. And at this stage, things were still the same. My attitude was still the same. But something started pulling at me. Heading into the weeks before soccer clinic, I had a conviction in my heart that my heart was bitter and that there should be more to me. And after soccer, after soccer clinic, I started feeling pretty convicted again that I was spending all my time on myself and what I wanted. I started to feel bad about not attending young adults and rather going to play soccer. This is when I phoned Ezra and asked to be, to be mentored by him, thinking to myself, what's the worst that can happen? Mm -hmm. If it doesn't work, then oh well. He gave me a book by Francis Chan called Multiply to go through while he, was on, while he was away. That's when I thought to myself, oh no, what have I done? I haven't read a book since high school, and I hate reading. Little did I know what God had installed, what God has installed for me. I started the first chapter and said to myself, this wasn't too bad. At this time, I was still playing soccer and holding on to it, but started feeling extremely bad about it. As I was going through Multiply, I could feel the Lord talking to me and hitting me pretty hard with convictions. I started going to young adults and diving into the word more and more, to the point where I was feeling the Holy Spirit work in me. I would spend two to three hours a night in the word, and for a long time, it's all I could speak about. While work, working through Multiply in my quiet time, we were, we were doing crazy love in young adults, and thought to myself, the Lord is definitely telling me, or trying to tell me something. In this time, the Spirit was changing me, and a few weeks later, I find, finally God took a true hold on me. We're doing God's love in young adults, and while Leanne and Michael were speaking, I could feel the Spirit working in me. I wanted to start crying, but managed to hold it in just for a few minutes. Until a video was played, that's when I started to break down and wept. It was all about God's love for me. While this video was playing, I was thinking to myself, I'm not good enough. I often think to myself, do people really like me? <laughs> or do they just tolerate me? I can say I don't have the best view of myself, and sometimes still think of that today. I also think to myself, in that moment, I've done so much wrong. My own biological father doesn't care for me. <laughs> but would, why would a heavenly father? Why would a heavenly father care for me? I'm not deserving of that love. <laughs> then it was like, then it was like the Lord was speaking directly to me, saying, "My child, you know not me, but I know everything about you." Psalm 139 verse one. <laughs> I knew you even before you were conceived, Jeremiah 1, 4 to 5. I chose you when, you, when I planned creation, Ephesians 1, 11 to 12. I offer you more than your earthly father could ever, Matthew 7, 11. To me, this was hitting me like a ton of bricks. It was such a good time for God's love for me. At this point, I was crying my heart out and speaking and praying to the Lord, saying, thank you for saving me and loving someone like me. So our last few months, the Spirit has been working in me and changing me to the point where I speak differently, act differently, and I have this unexplainable peace in me that God's will will always, be, will always prevail. I also have to thank the Lord for giving me godly people around me that have encouraged me and challenged me in this journey. My mom, you're the best. Leanne, Michael, Michaela, and Kaylin always being godly example and challenging me. To the young adults group, you're amazing and everything I have said today has nothing to do with me. This is all God's, God's working in me. He loves me and all of you to the extent that he sacrificed his own son out of love to save us. Thank you, church.
thank you Lord for your grace and your mercy and your peace we thank you for your faithfulness and Lord this morning that even as we come to worship you we believe and we know that you are the creator of all things Lord even as we see the heavens declare your glory and we see your majesty being shown through your creation but even this morning Lord Jesus that even as we stand here as your children created in your image and given your likeness Lord we are here to worship you and to thank you for who you are to us that all glory and honor goes to your name Lord in our hearts this morning that even as we bow before you Lord Jesus I believe that there's a story there's a testimony there's there's something to be grateful for and this morning we come Lord to say thank you for who you are so this morning I pray, Father, that even as your Holy Spirit is present here, as your Holy Spirit, Lord, has even softened hearts, I pray that your word, Lord, will fall upon, upon good ground this morning. I pray, Lord, that your word will take root in people's lives, Lord, that this won't just be a motivational talk, but Lord, I pray it'll be a word of encouragement and a word in, in season for someone this morning. Lord, this morning I pray that even as the gospel is being presented, I pray, Lord Jesus, that we'll understand the power that it has, Lord, to change and transform hearts. But Lord, not what I say, Lord Jesus, but what your word says. So this morning, Father, won't you come and have your way? In Jesus' precious name, and all God's people say, Amen and Amen. You may take your seats this morning. Again, I greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And again, what a privilege it is to go through the, or take people through the waters of baptism and to hear their stories and to hear of what God has done in their lives. And to be part of that journey, it's an honor and a privilege, and it's good to have the families here again to, to celebrate that. And, um, and I also want to say thank you so much to the Ridgecrest family for your prayers and support even as the leaders went away this past weekend on, on Friday night uh, to, to, to Jackson's Ridge um, and we spent some time um, in prayer, in worship and even going through scripture and trying to discover what does Lord have planned for the next five years for Ridgecrest. So I'm going to say it right now to the church is hold on to your seats. Because I'm excited of what God is going to do and what God expects us to do um, according to His Word. So we're going to present more of this in the coming weeks, but also next year we will present of what the next five years is going to look like for Ridgecrest. And I trust and I pray that you will grab onto the vision and that you'll put your hands to the plow because we're going to be working for the next five years. God has called us to do some great things and, um, and the main objective is evangelism. So... Um, I pray that you look forward to that. But do you have your Bibles with you? Let's get into God's Word. you have your Bibles with you? Yes. Bibles with you? Yes. Okay, five Bibles. Well done. Next week, I hope that we have more. But let's get into God's Word. And even as we've been going through the, through the series, we're going to pick it up from where I left off two weeks ago. But understanding the book of Acts is it's the call to the Great Commission. We see that it's the early church establishing the church through the lives of the, the disciples, the apostles, um, through Saul, which we spoke about two weeks ago. And we saw the adventures of his life and what that looked like. And we'll pick that up a bit later, even as we go continue in the book of Acts. But this morning we pick up the story in the book of Acts chapter 9. So if you can turn with me there, we're going to look at a character, uh, Peter, and see how God uses him in a particular situation. 
Acts chapter 9, reading from verse 32, and this is what the Bible says. Now, as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints who lived in Lydda. There he found a man named Ananus, bedridden for eight years, and who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Ananus, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose, and the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Let's go into verse 36. This is what it says. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, who translated, which the name was translated into Greek, means Dorcas. Imagine naming your daughter Dorcas. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days, she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in the upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room and all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. Verse 40, but Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And verse 42 says, and when it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Thank God for His Word this morning. The question that I want to ask you is, what is the greatest miracle that God can do for us? What is the greatest miracle that God can do for us? Maybe for some of us that are sitting here this morning, the greatest miracle that can happen for us is to win the lotto. Oh, y'all such saints, eh? My goodness. Do you know that this is a spiritual hospital for the sick? Okay, I would, it would be awesome if God could bless me with the lotto. But wouldn't it be a miracle if you had to win the lotto? And if God can sort out all your financial challenges, all your financial needs, because you know once all of that is settled and your bond is paid up and your car is paid up and all your debt and your credit card is paid up, the world will be perfect. What about the greatest miracle for peace in our land? For peace in our land. For peace in Israel and Palestine and peace around the world and the supernatural peace that we're all looking for. It's been tried and tested and man's peace does not work. If you remember this, that Bill Clinton tried to bring Palestine and Israel together. And even in that interview, as you go watch in, on YouTube, as they are about to sign the peace treaty, you could still see the animosity in their faces with the leaders. Man's peace does not work. And whatever you believe in, whatever your theological stance might be, that once the peace treaty is signed between Israel and Palestine, that Jesus is coming back, man's peace does not work. Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. In 1994, when Nelson Mandela was released, and I remember being at school, and this whole thing went throughout the country, peace in our land. Remember those t-shirts with the doves, the blue and white, you guys remember that? Peace in our land. Where are we standing today? Man's peace does not work, but if we're trusting in God for a miracle of peace, it can only be done with Jesus Christ. But maybe for some of us, we are expecting a supernatural healing. Maybe we are waiting for that miracle to happen. And once that miracle happens, I know that I'll be even more closer to God the Father. A couple of years ago in in East London, a a good family friend of ours was boarded off from work because he had a knee injury. And it was to the extent where he could not work anymore. And the pain that he used to go through, and he was in and out of hospital, and they had to put a metal brace around his leg that was screwed into the knee. 
and he had to walk around with this, but he couldn't do the normal duties that he would, like knowing him, because he was like a father to me, knowing him of going fishing with him, and I mean, he was a mechanic, and he was useful with his hands, he was an engineer by trade, he couldn't do any of that. And I'm not promoting this pastor, but Billy Graham came to town, to the Rivers Church in East London. And I remember the, uh, the night clearly as myself and Terrell, we were watching um, TBN and uh, we, were, we were watching this crusade happen. And as they were calling people up that were healed, I see this uncle walk up. And I'm like, I know him. And the next thing, the guy that was standing next to him has the crutches in his hand and the brace is off the leg, and this uncle's walking. And I saw a miracle take place. Unfortunately, he passed away with COVID in 2020, but from then till that point, he was healed. He was healed. He used it as a testimony to, to, to tell people about God and Christ and what God has done for him. And, and that was the first time that I saw that type of healing take place. And maybe we are looking for this great miracle. And the question again is, what is the greatest miracle that God can do? So this morning, even as we look at Scripture, let's see of what is, and let's try and answer that question, of what is the greatest miracle that God can do? So we come and we look at the text, and the Bible brings Peter back onto the scene. Because we've been looking at Saul and what he's been doing and how God saved him. And the scales has fallen off his eyes. And he's on mission and on ministry. And he spent time to be trained in, the, in God's word. But we see now Peter has come onto the scene. And when we understand the history of Peter, that we see that he was one of the first disciples. If you remember the story, Jesus was walking along the shore. And he comes across Peter. And Peter is a fisherman. And I believe, believe you me, he's a better fisherman than we are. Lennon, some of the fishing guys here. And he, it was his trade, it was his father's trade that he was doing. And Jesus came along and Jesus was teaching. And then Jesus says, take me out on your boat. Let's go. Let's put the fishing nets back and let's go. And Peter says, but we've done this all night. I know, because of my experience, I know that there's no fish. But for some of us at Ridgecrest, as fishermen, we try until... We still catch nothing. <laughs> Peter goes out with Jesus, and Jesus says, cast your net on the other side. And this miracle takes place where the nets are full of fish, and he pulls it in. And in that very moment, Peter denies Jesus. What do I mean by that? He says, leave me. I am a sinful man. Peter acknowledged that he's standing or he's sitting in the presence of the king of kings by seeing that miracle take place. And he says, Rabbi, teacher, leave me alone because I am a sinful man. But we see that even as Peter follows Jesus, we see that his name changes from Simon to Peter, which means the rock. But even with his name being changed and with Peter being exposed to serving the Lord, we see that Peter was not a perfect man. In fact, with the things that we read here, maybe I might consider him preaching here, but I'll have much doubt with, with that. Because the first thing he does is that in Matthew chapter 16, Peter rebukes Jesus. When Jesus is telling him that he needs to go to the cross, Jesus says, no. I mean, sorry, Peter says, no. And what does God, Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. We see in Matthew 26 and verse 40, Peter falls asleep in the garden when the instruction is given to him, I want you to pray. I want you to be awake and I want you to pray. Then we see in Mark chapter 14, verse 47, we see, I think Peter must have come from Florida. You know where Florida is? Over the hill? Because then he takes his knife out of his sock and then he cuts the O's ear off, man. <laughs> Hardcore. And we see Peter in 26. The story that we all know well and the one that he is known for is be denying Jesus three times. How is it that you walk with the Lord for three years? You rub shoulders with him. You have a meal with him. You come around the Lord's table with him. You see the miracles that he has done. And then when it comes, when the rubber hits the tar, 
He stands in the presence of people, seeing Jesus there and saying, I don't know him. I don't know him. Would you want that man to preach at this pulpit? But yet, <laughs> yet, the story of Peter fascinates me because it shows me the undeserving grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If your Bibles are still open, turn to me to John chapter 21, and I want you to see of what, what Jesus does, of what Jesus does, that even by seeing of what he does for Peter, I still stand here and I say, okay, thank you, Lord, I'm still worthy. <laughs> the Bible says in John chapter 21, reading from verse 9, it says, and when they got onto the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of fish, 153 of them. Man, I wish I could catch that many fish. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Verse 12, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, uh, now none, of them, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and, he, and gave it to them. And so with the fish. Verse 14. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. You know what I see in the text? After denying Jesus three times, Jesus still goes and makes breakfast for him on the beach. Do you understand the grace of God? And Peter is still being used by God. And we come to the text here in the book of Acts. And we see that Peter is the one that is going to be fulfilling what God has called him to do. We see that he's bold in his, as a proclaimer of the gospel. We see that 3,000 souls come to the Lord. We see that even though Peter denied him three times and Jesus showed him grace, we see that he's used to perform miracles. We see that he's an authoritative figure in the life of the early church. We see that he's the first, uh, gent the first missionary to the Gentiles. We see that he's the missionary to the Jews that are outside of Jerusalem. We see that Peter is willing and not ashamed of the gospel to go and be crucified upside down on the cross and be a martyr for the gospel even though he denied Jesus three times but Jesus still showed him grace. For some of us sitting here this morning, I don't know what your lifestyle might look like, but maybe, just maybe, it might be like Justin Monoran that was standing here this morning that has gone around the bush, has gone in the wilderness, and has come back to the point to realize that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. So Peter comes, and this is, it. this is how God uses him. So what is the greatest miracle that Jesus can do? So we see this, that Peter performs two miracles. The first one that he does is that he heals a man that is paralyzed for eight years. Do you have any idea how long eight years is? Do you have any idea how long that is? For the president of America of serving two terms... That's eight years, that in eight years, they can make and break the country. In eight years, things can change. In fact, within a day, things can change. So imagine being paralyzed for eight years, longing for a miracle. Do you think that paralyzed man was looking, looking for a miracle? Because the Bible doesn't say that he was born paralyzed. So if I'm assuming something happened, and now he's paralyzed. So I'm assuming that he knows what it is to walk. He knows what it is to be independent. 
He knows what it is to feed himself and take himself to the bathroom. He knows what it is to work. But being paralyzed for eight years and longing for a miracle and seeing what's happening around him and, Lord, if I can just, if I can just walk again, if I can just do this, if I can just do this. Can you imagine the burden that he was on people? Where people probably had to carry him around, where people probably had to feed him, where probably people had to take him to the bathroom. Now for those of us that are able to do things, it is hard to allow people to do something like that for us, am I right? It's uncomfortable. We become a burden. So this man was looking for a miracle. I'm sure of it. The second one is that we see from verse 36, we learn about Dorcas. She was a Christian. She was a disciple. She, she was somebody who loved the Lord. And we find that she was in the helping hands ministry. We find that she was the one that had compassion for the poor and the widows and the orphans. That's what the Bible tells us, is that she was doing good works. She was the one that was out there making sure that the widows were taken care of. And even as we read the story, we see that she was even capable of making tunics and garments for the widows. Because when the widows were standing in that room, they were presenting that to Peter to show, her, to show him what, what she was doing for them. But yet she died. But the disciples that were there and the widows that were there, I think that they were the ones looking for a miracle. Because I think Dorcas, absent from the body, is to be present with the Lord. But we see that Peter is on the scene to perform these miracles. With Peter's availability and based on his testimony, we see how Peter, number one, puts Christ first. If you take it down notes, number one, Peter puts Christ first. When it comes to miracles, Peter is highlighted first of who comes first. He says to the paralyzed man, Jesus heals you. Do you see any glory going to Peter? Peter? Unfortunately, in the world that we live today, it's because it's about money. We have prophets, we have apostles, we have pastors that have declared that I have a healing ministry. And what they've done is that they've taken the focus away from who the healer is onto who they are. So that when you see these bull billboards and these stickers all around, that it's a healing crusade, it's got nothing to do with Jesus, but it's got everything to do with the man of God that I'm willing to pay and buy tickets to be in that conference and to bring every wheelchair and every disabled person to that conference so that the man of God can heal them. That is false teaching. Peter says, Jesus heals you. Because so often, church, we want to chase the healing. We want to chase the miracle. We want that, but we forget who the healer is. Peter points us to the healer. I want you to notice that even when he speaks to Dorcas as she's lying there, the first thing that he does is that he goes on his knees and he prays. He prays that God is the one that heals. So in order to understand of where the greatest miracle comes from, it comes from the one who is the king of kings. Do you know who Jesus is? Do you know who the healer is? Because for some of us, we are chasing the healing or we are chasing the miracle instead of the one that gives it to us. And church, I want to tell you that even the miracles can let you down. Because even though the guy that was healed, that was paralyzed, do you think that he's still living today? Did, sorry? No. Earthly miracles only last for a season. But a God miracle is eternity. So let's look at scripture of understanding who Jesus is. Because this is who we need to turn to. And Peter identifies with this. But Philippians chapter 2 verse 9 to 11 if your Bibles are open. We see that all authority has been given to Jesus Christ. And Paul says this. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the what? Sorry? The name that is above every name. 
The name that's above every name that even the world and Hollywood knows of how pure and holy this name is. And his name is Jesus Christ. It goes on and says, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Every knee should bow and ev- in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It is only Jesus Christ that brings about miracles in our lives. There is no one else. There is no one else. Church, if you didn't get that, I pray that you get that this morning. There is no other name but the name of Jesus. He is the healer. He is the miracle worker. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 17 to 18, the Bible says, And these signs will accompany those who believe in the name. In the name. They will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents and their hands uh, in their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. It is in the name of Jesus Christ. It has got nothing to do with us as human beings. It is the Holy Spirit that empowers us to give us the ability to do the work of Jesus Christ, but it's in His name. I don't profess to be a prophet. I don't profess to be a healer. But I do what the Scripture tells me to do. That if I lay hands, but I'm doing it in His authority, not mine. I've got nothing to do with it. There was a pastor, Pastor Lucas, in fact, shared the story with me that when when he was at BTC studying, there was a pastor's wife that was really sick. And they they knew of a pastor that was in KZN that that sort of like had this this ability to heal people. But not realizing that when they phoned this pastor to come to Johannesburg to pray for this pastor's wife, that that pastor understood that it wasn't him, it was Jesus. Jesus. So you know what he did? Even though the people at BTC and the pastor's husband, I'm sorry, the pastor was, was like stressing that his wife is going to die. That pastor said, give me a few days to pray about it. And if the Lord wills, I'll come. And after a week of fasting and praying, the man of God had a word and he came and he prayed. But it had nothing to do with him. It was It had everything to do with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have to understand that. And when in understanding this miracle, it comes down to faith. It comes down to faith. Did you know that Jesus also had an experience of healing a paralyzed man? In the book of Matthew chapter 8, we see this one time that there was a centurion. And he was high up in the rank of the army. And he heard of Jesus Christ and he heard of what Jesus Christ can do. And he came to him and he says, please, my servant is dying. Please, can you come? But also realizing, the scripture tells us that he realizes that he was a sinner and and that he wasn't even worthy to have Jesus into his house. But there's one thing that he realized that he said, but if you tell me and if you command me, I will take it back to him. Because I'm also a commander and I give commands to people, but I am following under, I am submitting to your authority and there's something that I believe that you have that will be able to heal the servant. And Jesus turns around and says, in all of Jerusalem, I haven't seen faith like this. You see, the centurion had faith in the healer and not the healing. This morning, church, I want to encourage you that Jesus Christ is the one that has the authority. But if our focus is constantly on the miracle and the healing and all of that and not the healer, you know what we tend to do in our prayer? This is what our prayer looks like. We treat Jesus Christ like a genie in the bottle. Lord, bless me, keep me, save me. And when he doesn't do that, when he doesn't fulfill what what we want him to do, we get disappointed in him. And we turn our back on Jesus. Then we stop coming to church. Then we stop about in our prayer life. Then the pastor's at fault. And all of this, it's because of our perspective on what we expect from Jesus. He doesn't do things for us. He's paid the price already. The expectation is for us to worship Him and submit to Him because we are His children. He doesn't owe us anything. 
Did you get that? Jesus doesn't owe us anything. He's paid it all. All to him I owe. This morning I pray that we will turn to the healer even as Paul respects the authority of Jesus Christ and he says that Jesus heals you. And he knelt at the bed and he prayed first before he even performed the miracle. But faith comes in this form. Anybody watch the movie Facing the Giants? Watch the movie. If you haven't, I would encourage you to watch it. But there was a scene in that movie that, that really touched my heart and it, and it impressed on my heart. And, and, and in the scene, I just want to share with you of what takes place. And I pray that this will be a challenge for you this morning. Grant Taylor, who was the coach and his wife, had tried several times to have a child. And unfortunately, it just didn't happen. It was frustrating. So his wife, Brooke, um, got to the point of depression by making constant visits to the hospital for pregnancy tests. And the one time, even in this movie, the husband comes and challenged her and said, if God doesn't bless you with a child, will you still love him? Those words hits you to the core. So she goes to the hospital and they find out that she can't have a child and she comes out and she stands by the car and she's weeping and she says, Lord, I will still love you. That's what faith is. Your expectation of what God wants to do in your life, whether it's the lotto or whatever miracle that might be, if God doesn't want to give you what, you'd, what you want, will you still love him? Because remember, it's about him. It's about Christ. He's paid the price on the cross for you and I. So the greatest gift, number two, we see of what happens in the text. The greatest gift that God can give us is salvation. That's the greatest miracle. The greatest miracle that God can give us is salvation. I want you to notice that as the paralyzed man was healed, the story went into the city and people came to know the Lord. Isn't that a greater miracle? When Dorcas was raised from the dead, the story went around and people came to know the Lord. Salvation is the greatest miracle that we can get. Salvation. And it comes down to our faith in believing, just like these folk went through the waters of baptism this morning. It's about faith. You know this one time Jesus was teaching? And he was teaching in this house, but the crowds were just packed, packed inside there. And, and there were friends that, that knew that if they could bring their friend who needed healing because he was also paralyzed, if they could just get him to Jesus, he would be made whole. And the faith of the man that was paralyzed and the faith of the friends, they're trying to do something. So you, you, know, you know the saying of a board marker plan? I think these guys were Afrikaans. So... So what they did was they couldn't get into the front door because there was a lot of people. So they went and they opened up the roof and they lowered their friend down in the presence of Jesus. And Jesus says, because of the faith of your friends, salvation comes to you and healing. Salvation is the greatest gift because the miracles here on earth today will only last for a moment. But the greatest miracle is eternal life to be with the Father one day. That's the greatest miracle. And Jesus can still do it. This morning, you might be praying for a loved one. You might be trusting God for your son, your daughter, your grandchild, your friend. You might be trusting God for your parent. There was a young girl, and Pastor um, R.A. Tory, he shares this testimony of a man that was serving in his church. And the testimony of this man that got saved was that his young daughter loved the Lord. She was invited to Sunday school when she was 10 years old by a lady. And being in the presence of God at 10 years old, she accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. And she was part of what was happening in the life of the church. And back then, they used to call cell groups cottage meetings. Do you remember that? <laughs> so it was before Theo's time in the 1800s. And this little girl, all she wanted was her father to come to Jesus Christ. That's all she wanted. Her father was a drunk. Her father found every opportunity to be at the bar. So 
thinking about this, this young girl tells the church, let's have a cottage meeting at my house. Because if my dad doesn't want to go to the church, I'm going to bring the church to the house. So she invites the congregation to the house to have a cottage meeting. And she tells the dad, this is what's happening. And the dad's like, no, I need to get out of here. So he takes his coat and he's ready to walk out the door. And then she says, could you at least just do it for me? Just, just stay. Just stay and do it for me. And because of the love that he has for his daughter, he stayed in much fear and trembling. And as the, the service came and the people were doing their thing and they were singing and they were preaching and he, this guy was getting nervous and he was just, man, I just need to get out of here now. And after all the praying, the girl closed her eyes and said, Lord Jesus, won't you save my dad? And in that moment, it brought the dad to his knees with the gospel and that short prayer changed his life forever. You see, church, you might be thinking of praying long prayers or doing whatever you want to do in trusting God for a miracle. But he's the one that does the saving. And maybe our prayers just need to be shortened. Lord, please save them. No matter how long it takes, Lord, please save them. Lord, please have your way. The greatest miracle and the greatest gift is salvation. Even as we come to the close of the sermon this morning, I want us to look at our lives and recalibrate in our lives of what, is, what are the miracles that we are looking for in our life. And when we are despondent that we don't get what we want, I want to tell you that the greatest miracle is salvation. The greatest gift is salvation. The greatest gift was Jesus Christ coming, being born in a manger, as we're going to celebrate in, in a, probably in a month's time. In born in a manger, Emmanuel, God with us. The greatest gift that was given to us was Jesus Christ himself that brings genuine hope, genuine peace, genuine miracles. And he's come here not to judge us, but to save us and to give us a life of eternity. To give us a life of eternity. Sometimes our focus is so short-sighted that we only focus on the now. But church, I want to tell you that the gift that Jesus Christ gives you is not just for the now, but it's for eternity. That's the gift. And even as I close here, again, I want to share with you that my heart, even for the next five years, is for Rich Chris Family Church to be involved in every single household in a 9K radius from this church so that every single household can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. On this leaders retreat, we were trying to calculate of how many people stay within this area and I'm just thumb-sucking here, okay? Without even looking at statistics and census and that, they could be at least maybe 30,000 people just in this 9K radius who need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. If that's the greatest miracle, church, we have the mandate to be out there to do it. Are you willing to put your hand to the plow? This morning of what Christ has done in your heart, the miracle of changing you, of bringing you back into his throne room, of bringing you back into relationship with the Father because of his death and his burial and because of the blood that was shed to cleanse our sins and the love that he has for us, the world needs to hear that message because it is the greatest miracle that God can do for us. With our heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, let's meditate on that. Even as the worship team comes up and we sing this morning. Maybe this morning, as the Lord is speaking to your heart, Lord, let my focus be not on me. We heard this last week. That we decrease and He increases. Lord, let me have a conviction in my heart that the greatest miracle is salvation. Thank you for what you've done on the cross. Thank you for giving me hope and a future. Thank you for loving me 
And I pray this morning, Lord, it will be a conviction in my heart to share that miracle with other people. In Jesus' name, amen.